Hello and welcome to Securities Lending Saturday. I'm Roy Zimmerhansel and today we're going to be talking about Lehman Brothers and what happened as a result of their default. So pre, during and afterwards. So if securities lending is your business, Lehman is something you should really know about. Let's get to it. Welcome everyone, but I'm talking to you live on Saturday as we do every Saturday. This is week 14. Each week we have a look at one aspect of securities lending and today it's Lehman Brothers. Now we've been talking about risk and defaults and <clears throat> transaction failures and today is the big one. First, uh, let me say hello to all of our regular viewers and our subscribers. I celebrated this week because we uh, went over 200 subscribers and we had done 13 weekly episodes, which was a quarter of a year. Both things to celebrate. I did a, a little bit of a thank you video earlier this week. And frankly, in the past week, we've gained 20 uh, subscribers, which for the big YouTube channels is probably what they do a minute. But for us, it's really important. That's 20 more people that have an opportunity to learn about securities lending. <laughs> you can get access to the slide deck by going to uh, this site. So what you do is if you register for that, we'll end up emailing you uh, the slides, not just from this episode, but from all of the other 13 episodes. So without any further ado, I'm gonna get started. That gives you a list of everything we've covered so far. Today, we're gonna be talking about Lehman, as I've said, and next week, Thanks to some suggestions from uh, our viewers. One of, one of the viewers, Alina, thank you very much for your suggestion about timelines. So we're going to focus on that next week. Okay, so we're going to look at three things. We're going to look at the market in 2007, the Lehman collapse and what that actually meant, what people had to do, and then the aftermath of the default by Lehman or the collapse. Okay. Okay. Don't forget, this is, as I said, week 14. If you find this helpful in explaining securities lending and giving you more information and understanding, I'd appreciate you giving it a thumbs up. If you want to see videos as they come out and be made aware of that, you need to subscribe and ring the bell, and then you'll get each and every notification about new videos as they come up. If you can give us a, I'd appreciate that. That helps us get more viewers and helps me spread the word about securities lending, which if you are in the business is a good thing. Okay. I want to first give you some context about, about the business and thank you to the LinkedIn viewer from uh, New York. I can see that you've uh, said hello, but I can't see your name. The uh, platform isn't showing me who you are, but thanks very much for joining us. So the slide that I'm showing you now is from a prime brokerage survey from 2007 and early 2007 as well, because this was before the global financial crisis really started to kick off. And I'll get into the timing on that in a minute. But the idea here is just to give you a context of who the players were and where Lehman ranked as part of it. The survey results come from Global Custodian. I picked up these specific images though from plan sponsor which was and may still be a sister publication of global custodian so you can see that lehman brothers got 42 best in class awards so they were very much not only just players but they were uh, well recognized well thought of players the survey i think polled that year just over 2000 different hedge funds for responses so it is pretty representative of what the community thought. But the interesting thing is not only was Lehman ranked, you know, number five in terms of number of best in class awards, most importantly, they were actually ranked really highly amongst the big hedge funds because the survey, one of the questions is how big, how many assets under management do you have? And <clears throat> the respondents will categorize themselves and more than a billion dollars was the top category. So what this says 
is that Lehman Brothers was well thought of, not just generally, but specifically by large funds. And interestingly, in Europe, they were ranked number one by uh, a reasonable margin. So you can see how important they were in Europe. I'll talk about it in a minute, but was really a, a key battleground and, and had an impact on the business. Okay. So let me just go to the next slide. Okay. I'm just going to do a quick review of how Lehman touched securities lending. And this is you know, typical of, of most borrowers. So structurally, number one, there'll be borrowers of securities against cash collateral. Remember in the collateral video that I did that the agent lender will lend out the securities against cash, take that cash, invest it in the markets, provide a rebate to the borrower on a portion of that, and then split the difference with uh, the beneficial owners according to whatever their fee arrangement is. So Lehman borrowed against cash collateral. Of course, they also borrowed against non-cash collateral. And I have to say, Lehman was uh, always one of the most innovative and uh, leading edge borrowers in terms of using securities. And in fact, sometimes they cross that borrow uh, that that barrier. I remember a time when it was a Friday and we had loaned some securities to uh, Lehman's. This would have been mid nineties. And it was Friday afternoon. We'd done a margin call on them. It was, we weren't using tri-party again, which you can see more about in the uh, collateral videos, but they said late afternoon, they said, look, we don't really have any collateral that we can give you other than warrants. Now, warrants are not great collateral. They're not liquid. They don't necessarily hold their value. They're quite volatile instruments potentially. And of course they have an expiry date. They're tough collateral to really qualify as good in any way, but rather have some collateral than nothing at all. Promise that they'll pay us on Monday. That doesn't really work so well. So we took it in. So I'm not, I wasn't certain whether that was really true or whether they were just trying to push the edge a little bit, push the boundaries. So I had a conversation with them and we took it once, but we never did it again. Now, re of course, was also in the repo markets. And there's a particular activity that came out afterwards called repo 105, with, where Lehman used an accounting technique and arguably abused it. I'll go into that maybe in some other video, but it was an interesting and a little bit scary utilization of accounting rules because who knows what else, what else can be abused. And then finally, Lehman of course was also a money market issue. Lehman issued commercial paper and the commercial paper that they issued was bought by agent lenders on behalf of beneficial owners as with the cash collateral. So they were sellers into that. One of the interesting things about how Lee approached the business is that they would go to agent lenders and they would say, when we borrow securities against cash collateral, we can do that for the really widely available blue chip stocks that are called general collateral in the market. We can borrow that from anyone. Now we're not saying that you have to buy our commercial paper. Just like you can't say to us, we have to borrow from you. But if you buy our commercial paper, we probably will know that and be aware of what our funding sources are. And that might make us favorably disposed that where everything else is equal, we'll go to the agent lender and beneficial owners that buy more of our commercial paper rather than those that buy less. And of course that can have implications on its own, which I will touch on. So. That's how Lehman touched securities finance, uh, securities lending direct borrowers against cash or non-cash, repo market participants, and sellers of commercial paper to cash reinvestors. Okay, so that's really how they touched the market. Remember, you can always get these slides, as I said earlier. Uh, here's the place to go to download them. You go to Bitly, and then it's just SL Fundamentals, and we'll send you those slides, as I said earlier. So. You can sit back, have your drink. You don't have to be taking notes unless you want to. There's no quiz at the end of this. Okay. Context on what was happening in the market, because often people will think that Lehman precipitated the market crash, which of course they didn't. So there you go. Now it's in the right spot. So you can see that Lehman brothers. Uh, didn't happen until uh, much later and, and the markets had already turned. 
In fact, the, the MSCI World Index had already peaked in October. So up here is when the global in index peaked. Of course, the U.S. market carried on for a little bit, so it was some time before it affected the U.S., but equity markets started going down from there. And what that actually means in terms of securities loans is that if my stock, if I've loaned you a stock for $100 and I've taken an extra, just to keep the numbers simple, 10% collateral, which it would be unusually high, but just to keep the numbers simple, I've loaned you $100 of stock, I've taken $110 of collateral, and if it's cash, what I've done is I've put it into the market. I've bought $110 worth of securities and investments. Now, if the market falls by 5%, yeah, let's say 5%, and that $100 of stock that I loaned you is now only worth $95, then I'm going to do $95 times 110% of collateral, which, is, which would take me just to below 105%, so 104.5%. And what that would mean is you would ask me for some of that collateral back. And rightly so, because you don't want to be overexposed to me. So I have to give it back to you. Now, the problem is that I have invested that money. I don't have that money anymore. And frankly, the instruments that I'm buying, I want to hold on to those. And there might not be a secondary market for some of those. If I bought commercial paper, there isn't really a secondary market in the commercial paper. I need to hold on to that. So how did people get around that? As the final point here says this one here, it actually says that what some lenders were doing is rather than selling assets that had been made with the cash reinvestments and then returning that cash to the borrower, what they would do is they would make, a, make new loans, of course, on an ongoing basis. And the cash that they received in from that, rather than do the reinvestment with that cash, what they would do is say, oh, I've now got a pot of cash and cash is fungible. So they can return that to the borrower and I can give you back your cash by making new loans. And that's okay as long as I'm making more new loans than cash collateral that has to go back. And of course, the more markets fell, the more that I had to give cash back. And of course, as markets were falling, although there were some new short sales, there weren't as many as you might expect. And so that kind of strategy diminished. And so I'll move on to that in a second after I say hello to, to Jean-Pierre. So thanks for joining us again. And yes, I'm live. It's the last time I checked. Let me just see. Yes, I still feel live, but you never know. Markets are falling. Cash collateral becomes a little bit of an issue in terms of managing the return process of it. New loans help with that process. But as the markets continued to fall, investors really started getting nervous. As you see in this part of the market, Fed rate cut and all kinds of things, right? The regulators were starting to get really seriously involved in the market here. Then you had the Bear Stearns problem with the JP Morgan bailout. Markets were spooked then. In fact, there was, a, there was a, an internal memo at an Asian bank that said, stop dealing with Lehman Brothers on the day that Bear Stearns went bust. And there was a, a newspaper headline that said, Bear collapses, is Lehman next? Or words to that effect. So it shouldn't have been a, a complete shock to people that Lehman was going to come under pressure. Now that Asian bank rescinded the order uh, or the memo that day and uh, uh, apparently resumed trading with Lehman, but it does show you the kind of thinking that people were having in their minds at the time and the concerns about contagion as the markets fell. Now, from an investor point of view, they were getting nervous. Their asset values were falling. And even though you might expect them to leave their investments, the hedge fund investments that they had, because they might have some short exposure. So in a falling market might be a better investment. In fact, Many of them were just spooked and they just wanted to get out of everything. So they started doing withdrawals from hedge funds. Now there's a gating period. You can't, it's not like with a, a, a mutual fund. You can't just cash it in today. 
you have to actually make an announcement. You have to advise them. There are usually windows where redemptions are actually paid out so you can redeem any time, but it doesn't come out of the fund. You can't get your money back until periodic uh, points in time. And so what was happening is hedge funds were starting to get some redemptions. That meant that to raise cash to meet those redemptions, they had to sell some of their long positions. Now, even though the market was falling, their investment thesis is based on a mixture of long positions and short positions. So every time they close a long position by selling it out, they also have to close a short position. And that's just managing their portfolio. The impact on securities lending, of course, is every time they close a short position, they're having to buy back the stock and return the stock loan. And every time they're returning the stock loan, more collateral is having to go back. So all of this moved into an ever accelerating cycle of activity. And inevitably, the new loans couldn't meet the needs for the cash redemption or the cash collateral calls and cash reinvestments had to be sold. And they had to be sold in less liquid markets. Okay. So you can sell any asset really, if you're willing to take enough of a price drop. If you're willing to sell it bef below what you really believe the intrinsic value of, is, uh, of it is or the fair market value of that asset, you can sell it. I've used the example before. I bought my house in 2007, literally at the peak of the market. Good job, Roy. Look, it was always going to be a house we we're going to live in for 20 years. And so what happens this year, next year, the other year doesn't really matter. It's about the long-term view. It's in a good area. It's a nice house. I'm happy with it. And that's fine. But what happens if in the summer of 2009, I lose my job and I can't afford the mortgage and I have to sell the house? Well, the market for housing here in the UK had dropped pretty dramatically. And if I want to sell the house, I can only sell it for the market price. And if I want to sell it in a hurry, I can do that, but I have to take a big uh, price drop. So you can always sell assets. The question is, can you sell them for a good price? Okay. Now, in the meantime, of course, the markets themselves had, had deteriorated and there were problems with the corporate performance. And so some of the investments had actually been downgraded from the time that they were purchased in the first place. Now, that's not a problem. If you buy a piece of commercial paper, let's say it's a 90 day commercial paper issuance and uh, you hold in onto it until the end. Even if the, even if it gets downgraded halfway through from, or split, the reality is that's not, doesn't matter. As long as the company is still there at the end to redeem it, that's not a problem. But if I bought it when it was rated A1 and I have to sell it when it's rated A2, I'm going to have to take a hit, even though there will have been a period of time, which means that you're closer to the maturity. So it's less risky for the buyer. Nevertheless, you can expect a price loss. So all kinds of activity influencing it. And you can see in this chart, which shows you the rise of hedge fund assets under management and their dramatic impact from 2007 to 2008. These are year end figures. And of course that drop is a combination of investors redeeming and the asset values on the long side of the portfolio, uh, deteriorating. So there's a couple of factors, but you can see it's a pretty huge, let me go to the next slide. Now. Then Lehman defaults. So what do you do? So practically, if you have loaned Lehman Brothers securities against cash collateral, you have to sell those cash investments. So you have to get your cash back from that. And you use that to repurchase the securities that you had loaned to Lehman Brothers. Now, two things. Number one, remember I said you might have had to take a loss on some of those cash investments that you made. Hopefully that was partially offset by the asset price falls on the assets that you loaned out to Lehman Brothers and their prices had fallen and you were trying to buy them back. Now, of course, when Lehman defaulted, there was a big market sell-off. So I think that kind of helped in the process, if you will. If at any time you ever think that falling market prices help, then this is one of them to that extent. But of course, Lehman went out of business on a Monday the collateral calls and the margining would have been fine as of Friday. So it's not like there would have been a huge fall other than what happened intraday. And of course it was a pretty significant fall intraday on the Monday. Uh, so that's against cash collateral. If it was against securities collateral, you had two sets of activity there. You had to sell 
the securities themselves. So again, you were selling into a falling market if they were equities. If you held government bonds though, it probably means that your asset value and the collateral was pretty good. And in fact, number of people that I know, a number of firms had increased the margin that they took from Lehman Brothers, but even more had left the margins at the same level, but took a bigger proportion of government bonds collateral from Lehman Brothers. So they stopped taking riskier assets in the months running up to Lehman Brothers default because everyone was aware that uh, counterparty credit conditions were deteriorating over time and Lehman was a likely candidate to be in further trouble. Although I don't think many people predicted that they would be, that they would go out of business and be allowed to fail rather than bailed out. So in any case, the quality of collateral in many cases had improved overall or the margins had. So people were in a little bit better position on the securities collateral side of things. And don't forget from a beneficial owner point of view, if the agent lender provides you with a borrower default indemnification, you are protected to an extent. Now, if it's cash collateral, remember in the collateral video, I said that agent lenders typically don't guarantee or don't indemnify against losses from cash reinvestments. So if there were losses from those sales, the fund would have to bear it. So in my example earlier, the borrower gives you $110 of cash, you invest it, that turns into $105 because there's some losses on that. The agent lender will uh, use that $105 to replace the assets that were actually sold or that you need to buy back, sorry, to, to replace the positions that you'd loaned to the defaulting entity. On the securities collateral side though, the difference is that the agent lender says, well, no, I'm actually replacing the asset. So uh, if the securities that I've taken as collateral are insufficient, then that's just a straight out wash. So that's the difference in the securities collateralized market. The indemnification covers the whole thing in the, in the cat, in the cash collateralized world, it only covers you to the extent of the value of the cash proceeds. Now, on the repo side of things, again, a repo, typically Lehman Brothers would have been a borrower of, a ca of cash, so they would be providing excess securities as collateral. So you, what you do then is you sell those securities to get your cash back. Hopefully you've taken good quality assets from Lehman Brothers and the assets have either retained their value or if they're government bonds, maybe even increased in a time of crisis there. And then finally, the uh, money market commercial paper that Lehman Brothers might have issued and was purchased by agent lenders. Frankly, commercial paper is an unsecured loan. So the investors that bought that commercial paper became creditors of Lehman Brothers and no doubt had quite a lot of interaction with the liquidators after that. Now, if you go back to my example where I said Lehman would borrow stock from firms that bought a lot of their commercial paper. Think of the process. Lehman Brothers borrows, ca borrows securities, gives cash. Agent lender then takes that cash, buys commercial paper from Lehman Brothers. And as I say, commercial paper is effectively an unsecured uh, obligation. So what you've actually done is you've loaned out securities versus Lehman commercial paper. And the Lehman commercial paper is just an unsecured loan to Lehman Brothers. So you have to question the value of that uh, collateral. Now, if you would have bought commercial paper from anyone that didn't go bust, quite frankly, that's still a robust investment, but that's what you would call wrong way risk. Because what you're saying is when there's a condition where there's a problem with my counterpart, the collateral I have protecting me against that is also likely to have a similar or the same problem. And of course, if Lehman's my securities lending borrower and Lehman is the issuer of the commercial paper, they that is about as closely correlated as you can get, depending on which Lehman entity it is. But fundamentally, they were all uh, in the same boat. So that's what you actually do in the event of a default. Now, what happened when Lehman defaulted? Okay. When Lehman actually defaulted, let me just get rid of, let's get rid of that caption. There we go. As I said, the Lehman default required mass collateral disposals and cash sales 
of the, or sales of the cash investments into uh, less liquid markets. So that in itself had problems. And when the market was falling and certainly during the crash, even though you might think that this wouldn't be the case, there isn't a huge amount of short selling activity going on because people weren't really interested in making new loans. Many investors suspended their programs, their lending programs. So there were no new loans they were interested in making. And the prime brokers themselves weren't all that keen on their investors taking on new positions and certainly not new leverage positions. There are not many new short sales. And so again, the cash that might come in from that kind of activity dried up as well. So what was the outcome of all of this? Frankly, you can see this chart here, which is, which was an, an old chart from market, which then became of course, IHS market before its latest acquisition or, or being acquired recently. And you can see the market just fell off a cliff. So of say up to $4 trillion was the size of the securities lending market. Then uh, it basically halved and it's stayed around that size ever since. So it's never really recovered. Now, again, I'll talk about this some other time, but the growth of synthetic activity, I think masks the failure of the market to increase from here. So although there's still around $2 trillion of securities on loan, the short position exposure actually is much higher than that. It's just executed in different ways, not in the securities lending cash market. So fewer assets on loan. Now, even this has changed over time. The government bond side of the business because of regulatory change will have grown in recent years, adding some new income and equities really is, and corporate bonds are the ones that didn't, haven't really recovered to the same extent. There was less revenue. Now in the old days, again, this is an old chart, but I used to track the uh, securities lending revenues from the agent banks that would publish the data. Mellon stopped publishing it and then merged with Bank of New York on July 1st, 2007. But you can see that for all of them, there was, uh, or for two of them, certainly there was a huge drop off. And you can see that for a couple of them. Uh, so in this green line, JP Morgan, and in the orange line, which in this case, you might not be able to see the difference. That was Northern Trust, whereas uh, this sort of darker brown is uh, State Street and the purple is Bank of New York. I don't know, but my guess is for both of these ones where it was extended, that was because they had slightly longer cash reinvestment timeframes for their average duration of their investments. And since interest rates were cut, as you can see in an earlier slide, you can see that there was a, a rate cut there and there were more rate cuts along the way, you will see that. So what happens is if I've made an investment today at today's rates for a year or two years, and someone else has made an, an investment for six months to a year, what happens is as that investment matures, their ability to roll it over at a higher interest rate is diminished. And so if you have a longer average duration at this period, you can spread out investment for a longer period of time and generate incremental income ahead of the market. That's my guess. That's not, that's not factual. I'm just guessing there. Now, a question or a further comment on the commercial paper market. I told you it wasn't very liquid. And in fact, there was so much selling that was going on at the time and no one really wanting to buy any new commercial paper, because if you had cash, you'd rather just sit on the cash rather than make an unsecured loan in, into the market. The reality is, as it says here, by the end of 2008, the U S federal reserve ended up owning about 90% of the outstanding commercial paper in the market. So that's a huge shift. So that's what happened in the market. Right. So did anyone lose money? Well, the answer I think is yes. I don't think you need to be a rocket scientist to figure that out. And let me just go through some of these points. As I've talked about several times, if you bought a uh, Lehman commercial paper and money market instruments, then you became a creditor, right? Because you can't protect cash in the event of a default. If I was a hedge fund client of Lehman Brothers, there might be a number of different ways that I could have been impacted. My assets might've been frozen if they were custodians. So Lehman was sitting on them. They were frozen until the liquidator was able to determine that those are really my assets, not someone else's and not Lehman Brothers. So assets were just frozen and you couldn't do anything. More importantly, what a lot of investors that were using Lehman as prime broker hadn't really appreciated 
was that Lehman was able to use, in many cases, their assets as collateral for Lehman's own obligations, either on behalf of its clients or on behalf of uh, Lehman's own positions. So those assets had already been used and in the vernacular rehypothecated, and the receivers of that collateral, well, that's called collateral that they sold to cover their own exposures to Lehman Brothers. There were people that suffered losses as a result of that, and that was probably the biggest risk. Hedge funds didn't really realize until Lehman defaulted. Okay. And the bottom line is some or many Lehman hedge fund clients effectively ended up going out of business. Now for securities lenders, one of the key things is there have been multiple agreements, even standard industry agreements over time, and not necessarily has everyone updated the agreements, the old agreements, every time a new one comes in. The reason a new one comes in is because there has been a found a flaw with the previous one or regulations have changed or market conditions have changed or views on risk have changed. Whatever it is, there's a reason why the new one comes out. And if you have left the old one in place, and brought in the new one or not substituted or, or uh, negotiated a new updated one, the liquidations and some of the terms may have impacted you and may have diminished your returns or in fact, possibly even caused you a loss. So look to me, if you have old documents in place, anytime, get them updated. Now, a lot of lenders or a number of lenders, they didn't sufficiently diversify their collateral, or in some cases, they even found that they held collateral on Lehman's default that they couldn't be outright buyers of. And this is one of the big lessons every time there's a loss in the market. We always find for some reason that people end up owning assets that they couldn't have purchased outright. And so if you come to today's market, I keep drawing a parallel of this to ESG assets, and I don't want to go off on a tangent, but if an investor can't buy an asset because of their ESG concerns on the front end and make an investment in it, they, to me, they shouldn't take it as collateral, even though collateral is temporary, because unless you have a pledge agreement, it's a transfer of title and you own it. So if you can't buy it, you shouldn't own it as collateral in my view. So I think lenders really got a better appreciation of the collateral again, market turnover and diversification, concentration limits, turnover limits, all of that became very clear as to what was good and what was less good. And again, the point on securities collateral indemnifications versus cash collateral indemnifications. Again, if you were in cash collateral and you bought treasury bonds, you probably were more than fine. You probably had excess. And in fact, I know quite a lot of agent lenders that ended up with excess collateral and didn't have to rely on their own capital reserves to indemnify clients. And I know a number that actually gave collateral back to the liquidators for the estate of Lehman. And look, the estate of Lehman probably is still alive today. And the liquidators have got quite a lot of money back from that over the years and paid it out to creditors. Now, the interesting thing is this final point where there were some beneficial owners that had losses because usually because of cash reinvestment and they, a number of them got into arrangements with their agent lenders where the agent lender fronted them the money so that they didn't lose principal on the cash investments in return for signing an extension to their contracts perhaps with a different fee split so that the agent lender could earn their money back over time. So it's, it's something subtle and behind the scenes, but from an investor point of view, it made them whole. So that's good. And all that happened was they made less money than they otherwise would have done from securities lending for a future period of time until the agent had effectively earned back the money that they had fronted up. So just a, an interesting little twist, right? The impacts fundamentally prime brokers gave less leverage to hedge funds and hedge funds asked for less and regulators certainly wanted them to give less. And today we still see that the leverage today is still small compared to what it was. So if you just look at this yellow chart here, uh, you can see that between proprietary trading from banks and hedge funds that looked at that resulted in about $9.7 trillion of capital being deployed. Some of that through actual capital, which is the lower part of the, the bars there. And sometimes 
because of leverage. So we can actually see is that banks were providing or able to obtain far more leverage than they were willing to give to their hedge fund clients. Banks always operate on fairly thin margins in terms of that and want to leverage things up. That's why regulators really wanted to stop them doing proprietary trading. Again, I'll argue some other time why that's not really such a good thing, but it is what it is. If you look at the, a couple of years later, that was more than half the amount of capital and leverage deployed into trading strategy went down by more than half. So you can see bank proprietary trading basically disappeared. Uh, hedge fund leverage went from three times to two times and the amount of their own investments in there stayed the same. So uh, hedge funds uh, dropped by over uh, $2 trillion worth of deployed capital and positions. And that was partly because, as I said, prime brokers wouldn't give them collateral, partly because hedge funds didn't want to do it and partly because regulators didn't want them to do it. But many prime brokers went through their existing relationships and cut relationships and said, thank you for being a client, but we're not interested in having you anymore. So it was just caused real ruction. Okay. The other thing is the way Lehman clients got treated in the U.S. part of Lehman, the, the Lehman prime brokerage in the U.S., versus Lehman Prime Brokerage in the UK. Here it was, or in Europe, here effectively it was shut down. That was it, close the business, asset positions frozen. In the US, people were able to continue to trade out, close down, move assets. It was much more structured, much more orderly, and allowed firms to continue operating. So many of the funds that had left the US to come to Europe under European regulations, where it was much more commercial rather than statutory in terms of leverage. They got the extra flexibility here, but they found out they had less protection. So many of them shifted back to the US. Now hedge funds also were aware of hedge funds reusing their collateral and they restrict it where they have the economic or relationship club to do that. And as I talked about earlier, there was a big shift to synthetic positions, which arguably get the market to a similar size, in my personal opinion. Generally, so this was Lehman directly, but generally global financial crisis, liquidity constraints on banks so that they have to operate, be able to operate 30 days on their own without access to money mark. The effective elimination of bank proprietary trading. In theory, banks can still do proprietary trading. It's just prohibitively expensive, so they don't. And the interesting thing, and this is what's led to government bond borrowing increasing, there has been a regulatory requirement for increased collateralization, partly because more derivatives are cleared today through central counterparties. And for OTC ones, the regulations have come in place requiring those to be collateralized, even though they're bilateral relationships. The Lehman has either directly or indirectly contributed to a really dramatic change in the market infrastructure operation. Okay. So that's, that's pretty much it. Of course, all of these are really complex issues. I go into detail much more on all of these topics in my paid for course, this uh, purple one, the introduction to securities lending. We also have a free primer though, for anyone that wants to spend 50 minutes learning about securities lending at an overview, you'll get a good uh, grasp of the business by watching that. Both of those are accessible at the website in our courses link. And so paid for free, we're here to educate. Right. In summary, the market in 2007 was arguably the biggest lending revenue year ever. People estimated maybe $15 billion worth of, of fees generated that year. And it's from a lending point of view, it's never really got back to that level. So will that be the biggest year ever? I think in terms of securities lending itself and not the wider synthetic uh, scope of it, it might just be, you never, the Lehman collapse was a huge lesson in counterparty exposure. So they weren't the first firm to go bust. Uh, they won't be the last firm to go bust, but they have certainly been the biggest firm to go bust in this business. A lot of lessons were learned across the board. Really, there isn't anyone in that was part of the business then that didn't learn something, whether you were an agent lender, a beneficial owner, another prime broker, a tri-party provider, a central counterparty, everyone learned something and adapted their practices and procedures as a result of Lehman. And the aftermath, as I said, just in summary, leverage is down, proprietary trading is essentially gone. This shift to derivatives 
increased collateralization in other areas. And of course, the bottom line is that the bottom line has been impacted. That's the summary of Lehman. As I said, next week, part, part 15, actually, that should say now, will be process timelines. And we'll go through that. Anyway, that's it. Thanks to all of you watching. Thanks to our subscribers and appreciate you being here. Have a great Saturday, a great weekend, and catch you next week.